Beyond the hot pools and geysers of Waiotapu, in the centre of New Zealand's North Island, horizons of exotic pines mark the vast and special territory of the young giant Kaingaroa. A wooden tower built on a solidified lava plug topping Rainbow Mountain is northern outpost of Kaingaroa's defences. It dominates the highway north to Rotorua, but few travellers turn to see what lies behind it. One of the world's great man-made forests, extending over some 500 square miles. There are many roads through the forest. The Forest Service is concerned about the risk of disastrous fires, perhaps from a dropped cigarette butt. Plantings made 30 to 40 years ago, over hundreds of square miles, are now maturing forest. Already in the midst of the plantations, the running of the forest needs a headquarters village of about a thousand inhabitants. To the north, are the lakes round Rotorua. Within, cleared squares for loading thinnings are conspicuous. As labour becomes available, more and more of the compartments or blocks are being brought under full management. Outside some of the forest border, the dense natural scrub of the Kaingaroa Plains is still just as the forestry pioneers knew it 40 years ago. On another area of frontier land, preparations are made for clearing. The scrub here is rather too sparse to give a clean and complete burn without crushing and drying. The area is to be planted in pines to extend and diversify the great forest. A fire usually begins in dried out undergrowth. As it grows, it climbs to the crowns of trees. Fire, however, is something anyone can use, even members of Kaingaroa's own defense force. Outside the forest borders, on days of low wind, fire hazards are removed a square mile at a time. A mile of fire on the leeward edge of the block of scrub is lit first and then the area is completely encircled. Confined by a belt of ground cleared beforehand, the fire moves inwards. Danger of spreading the wrong way soon passes, and from north, south, east and west, lines of fire attack the block center. As the fires converge, so do the winds, drawn inwards from all sides by fierce updraft. Even rotation of the earth gets into the act, combining updraft and converging winds into small, playful tornadoes. Right to the end, Fire crews with tank wagons are on constant watch. Protective frontier burns by no means represent a scorched earth policy. Some clear the ground for prosperous pastoral farms. Sheep farmers make ideal neighbors for a huge territory of inflammable fir and pine. On other recent burns, 
flags are set out as markers for planting. Six feet apart, the men advance in line, planting a tree at every two paces. The hand planting used on the burnt off hills is replaced on the flat by machine planting. Setting trees at six foot intervals each way, two men can plant about 10,000 trees a day, say 10 acres. No such machines when the main forest was planted 30 and 40 years ago. In the Depression days, men from all walks of life, on unemployment relief, planted with spades and lived in remote hutman camps. The far-sighted afforestation scheme of those days has changed the economic picture of the whole district. Early fellings from the young forest yield timber of millable size and in great quantity. One consequence of the vast plantings in depression years is that the forest lacks age diversity. Too many square miles of timber are coming to maturity together. To counter this, some compartments are clear felled before complete maturity, at the rate of 3,000 acres a year. When clear felling is done in summer, the cones open and extraction of the timber works seed into the soil out of the way of birds. Good natural regeneration follows. In the coldest parts of the forest, a few trees are left unfelled to give seedlings some degree of frost protection. Such nurse trees are later poisoned. After natural regeneration, thinning is necessary. Thinning is immediately followed by low pruning to keep the timber free of the knots caused by branches. Later, medium pruning takes all branches below 20 feet. In recent years, a final high pruning up to 35 feet has been tried. It's still too early to know how far this high pruning improves timber quality, but using ladders the job can be done quite rapidly. Each man tends to have his own methods of using this equipment. A final thinning of pruned forest yields timber suitable for milling. 
This stand is Corsican pine, which is rather slow growing by New Zealand standards. The fastest growing timber tree in the forest is Pinus radiata. This block is of the same age as the adjacent block of Pinus ponderosa, grown from seed of Canadian origin. Across the road is a more successful block of ponderosa, grown from seed from the United States. Correct choice of seed is very important. European larch has made good growth with many blocks of 30 to 40 years old. But even more successful than larch are the extensive plantings of Douglas fir, now halfway to maturity. Given an 80-year rotation, Douglas fir will yield timber of greater value than will radiata pine. For a 30 to 40-year rotation, Pinus radiata is the best tree. It is, however, a variable species. To breed for the best types, Shoots from mature, good form trees are grafted onto seedling stocks at the Forest Research Institute, Rotorua. The grafts are not for timber, but for seed orchards. They come into bearing very young, saving the plant breeder many years of waiting. Pollen from desirable types is blown onto female cones of the grafted pines. A further advantage of grafting is that bearing young, the trees hold their cones at a nice accessible level. Ripe cones from approved trees go into the drying kiln. seed extractor was made in the institute workshops. The seed cleaner imported from Germany. Bird proofing mixture is coated onto the seed in an ordinary cement mixer. The seed goes to tree nurseries all over the country. Biggest sowings being at Kaingaroa Forest. Less than a year after sowing, tap roots are machine cut and the little trees lifted for packing. Workers include young woodsmen from the department's training scheme and a veteran nurseryman who, earlier in his career, raised many of the first trees planted to make the Kaingaroa forest. Diversification makes the forest more proof against insect pests and less vulnerable to fire. 
the early planted forest had very inadequate fire breaks. One precaution is the carrying of water to concrete tanks along the roads, ready to suppress small fires before they grow beyond control. Fire breaks are being widened in the course of reshaping the forest for the future. From almost every hill, a constant watch is kept. Whenever the least wisp of smoke is seen, within the forest or anywhere near it, the different bearings from the several lookout towers are immediately radioed to headquarters, so that fire trucks can rush to the point where the bearings intersect. 500 square miles of national wealth, though, needs even better inner defences. The old fire breaks are all narrow, and a start has been made on expansion into a half-mile-wide belt of pasture. A reason why the forest was planted was that pumice land was without value for sheep or cattle, which died of so-called bush sickness. Today, this is put right by a trace of cobalt salt in the fertiliser, and wide fire breaks can be kept grazed down by valuable stock. Exotic conifers grow very much faster than New Zealand's native trees, and the young forest is already yielding 50 million cubic feet of timber a year, about half saw logs and about half pulpwood. Round the year, and in all weathers, workers bring out the yield. Timber for pulp and paper, timber for farmers' fence posts, timber for houses, and sawn logs for export. A thousand men work daily in the forest, two to the square mile. By day and night, the timber keeps moving out to feed the sawmills and paper mills and to make way for new growth. A thousand men in the forest and beyond the forest borders, multi-million pound domestic and export timber industries give valuable employment to many thousands more. At, say, 40 years old, Kaingaroa is making his presence felt in the New Zealand economy. But it is not until the end of the century that the 500 square miles behind the loading bays will be in really full production. When that day comes and Kaingaroa is fully grown, he will stand as an economic giant among the timber resources of the world.